being a conscious consumer is often is a luxury because when we're talking about like EJ communities, often they don't have the luxury to be a conscious consumer and to when you're just trying to feed your family or you know trying to get the basic needs that you know you need to survive. Of course, you don't have the luxury of looking into transparent companies and buying organic and doing all those things. But those of us who do have those luxuries should take advantage of that, um, just in terms of being conscious of where your money is going. And I think that if you have the ability to do that, then you can do that. Um, but about going back to the EJ community model and talking about, um, you know, there's the gentrification and um, obviously all the negative effects of that. Just wondering if you guys have any examples of um, some EJ communities where there have been a lot of positive things that have come into those environments in terms of jobs or um, things that are better for the community as a whole that's for the existing community and not for other people you know, coming in a generalized area in New York or in the rest of the country. Or what, what that would look like <laughs> um, if that were to happen. Um, the first example that comes to mind is actually not an example of one that's been successful in the fight against gentrification, but one that has unfortunately really been drastically changed because of gentrification, but the opportunity it offers communities now facing that to learn and how we can do things differently and where we need to get involved at what stage. So I'm thinking of Williamsburg. Williamsburg, for someone who's from New York, a native New Yorker, to be there now is it's heartbreaking. It's completely different from what I remember it to be in the 80s and the 90s. It provides an example of what a community like Sunset Park has to get ready to do. It was almost exactly like Sunset Park. It was an industrial waterfront, predominantly Latino, mostly working class. And it was rezoned. So now, as an environmental justice community, we've understood the importance of zoning and getting our communities involved in that process and working with City planners has given us the opportunity to understand this rezoning process and understanding the cooler process and making sure that our community is fully aware of the opportunities that they have to speak up and to speak for what they want and what they envision for their communities and what they do not want. So I think of examples of where we can learn in terms of examples to look at, communities to look at that are autonomous and collectives and moving away from the kind of community that is consumer driven and wasteful. I think of Mother um, Rome, Spain. Um, I don't know if you want to go into that, but you guys can look it up. I would just add, you know, I think for me, you know, I work on policy, right, is groups that have addressed these issues more successfully are ones where they stop and they say, you know, we're going to fight this fight, we're going to get apart. But we also actually have to be thinking 10 steps ahead. Right? And they're going to say, we need to engage in the zoning process. We need to change that policy. We need to start a housing cooperative. Right? We're not just going to rehab a building and let people live there. Because if their kids you know, need the money, they're going to have to sell that. Right? There are, you know, many of us in the room are either experts or in school to become experts. And our job, in some ways, for me, is to figure out what tools I can bring to communities that allow them to, like, not just achieve the short-term goal, but to build power and autonomy. Uh, Williamsburg lost 30% of its Latino community in 10 years, and in some parts of Williamsburg, 30%. Um, and that seems to be okay with a lot of people uh, who live there. And um, in Sunset Park now is faced with the same challenge, um, with um, really a developer-driven, th these developers are actually want to become the planners. They're really engaged in community-based planning and they're planting local leadership and paying for it. Um, and supported by the administration that's going to come out with its one NYC plan uh, any day now. So, um, so those are some of the challenges. Um, any other questions? Um, the pink sleeve? Okay. Um, I am a planner. Um, I have been also in Cuba and um, I'm glad that that point was brought up. Because what's happening right now in Cuba is that yes, they do have uh, these organic uh, um, farms and so on. But because of all the tours that are happening and all these uh, wonderful hotels that are popping, the good food goes to those hotels for tourism. And the locals then many times don't have um, food to eat. So uh, this 
social justice is really a reflection of um, um, what's going to be happening there if, uh, if they don't take care of that. Uh, but what was going to be my point is that, yes, what we have right now in order to, to use renewable energy is not working. But when I ask engineers uh, the effect of aggregate geothermal, um, they don't they don't have an answer. When I ask uh, um, how are we going to be recycling solar panels, there is not an answer. When I ask um, what's happening with the change of, uh, of the wind currents and the theory that are affecting the bees population, no answer. So I think that uh, in order also to be able to promote these new um, systems, we need to have a much better knowledge of the long-term impact in order to convince our local people to, to buy into it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the talk. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, hi. Hi. Sorry, my name is Jenny. I work with Small Island States. Um, really appreciate the talk. I was hoping maybe Anna or Elizabeth, you could go into a little bit more detail when you're talking about specifically in Sunset Park, the governance, you know, the New York plans coming out, you're working with planners. So what does that look like in terms of are you lobbying the city council? What did you say? You said you sort of Oh, sorry. I was wondering if you could go a little bit more into detail in terms of when you're looking to advocate to improve um, or to sort of make protections in Sunset Park um, and have specific redesigns happen. Is it that you reach out to city council, and if so, have you found them any members receptive, or is there opportunity there, or planners, are they like within the mayor's office in terms of how does that work? Like where, I guess, are you finding... Are you a student with Pratt? Sorry? Are you a student with Pratt? No, sorry. Who are you with? Um, I work, <laughs> I, I'm not here, sorry, I work at the UN with the Maldives. Okay. Yeah, sorry. That's how paranoid we are. Oh, okay. oh no, like I'm on, I'm on, like trying to on the good side. Like I want to, no, sorry, I thought I wanted to just like know how it works. So, like, um. so, so we've done no, literally that. That's how paranoid we are. Oh, okay. uh, so what we've done is we've created a coalition. It's called Protect Our Working Waterfront Alliance, and it's an alliance of a lot of different groups, both local and citywide, that are looking at making sure that the industrial waterfront remains. Uh, a working waterfront and that people can walk to work and have beauty and jobs that pay well and that it also addresses climate change. So those are the things we're doing. We're training people uh, on zoning. Uh, we have workshops on Euler in both English and Spanish. We've created tools to train people. Um, everything from uh, infographs so that people can on their own do that. We've created videos to educate folks about what are the implications of creating what they call the innovation or the creative economy, which is really the displacement economy. And for those of us who, as I mentioned before, are, are descendants of colonization, uh, say to us, uh, what was innovative when they bought trinkets and took our land, right? It was, it, there's nothing innovative about displacement. We've been innovated in a minute. But what is innovation is really looking at the industrial sector and repurposing it so that it, it basically is building for climate adaptation and resilience. So if you're thinking about development in New York City and you're looking at all these green buildings and all these buildings that you want to be carbon neutral, who builds that? Where does that get built? When you're looking at infrastructure that is aging, and might not be able to withstand uh, extreme weather events, where is that being repaired? Where is that being fixed? Where is that being rebuilt? Where does that happen? That should be happening in the industrial sector. How do we bring those markets in? How do they even find out? How does that market become incentivized so that they know that the largest significant maritime industrial area in New York City is a place where we build locally to address climate change? So that's an industry that we're going to need for years, for many, many years, because we're not going to be able to stop climate change. And so that <coughs> is innovation. And why is that important in terms of displacement? Because once you create a sector that is hiring locally and that doesn't displace, people will be able to walk to work, have those jobs, make livable wages, and they don't have to move. But when you shrink it and you commercialize it, Basically, and you bring in Time Inc., and you bring in Saks Fifth Avenue, and you bring in all the uses of the heat brought into the, the waterfront in Sunset Park, well, that comes with a need for Starbucks. And all of a sudden, the bodega on the corner can't be there anymore. But people who resell our mango and our platanos back to us at a price that we can't afford. And so that, we know, is t old, dated, tired, and done everywhere else. So. Um, but I wasn't trying to get into that. You drove me into that. I wasn't asking for a discussion for another day. But 
it is completely connected to how we address climate change on a local level. We are creative thinkers. And the other thing is, we talk a lot about things like geothermal and things like that, but we really also have to think about what, it, what happens locally, block to block. How do we build it block to block? Not just leadership, but adaptation and resilience on a very local level, which is one of the things that we do at our organization. I hope I answered your question. Any other questions? How much time do we have? Forty minutes. We have time for lots of questions. Oh my God! I want to jump in on something. Yes, go ahead. Um, the woman before who was talking about how do we get folks to feel ownerships over these transitions, and I think to touch on that for a minute, it's to have folks own the transitions is how they feel ownership over the transitions. We've been talking a lot about just transition up here, um, and I think in one of the ways we're talking about it is you know. Fossil fuel industry jobs are bad. We don't need to do them anymore. We can't do them anymore. And so we're going to transition into like local green economy jobs and build up our people to do them. But also within the broader framework of what a just transition is, like transitions are inevitable. Where do we find the justice in that? And I think the justice comes from people owning the solutions. So if you don't know how, like I think a lot of people aren't going to know how to recycle. Um, a solar panel, but if you have worker-owned co-ops or people actually have ownership and stake and are benefiting from the green job, like they're going to know how to recycle solar panels. Or if you have other solutions that people are embedded in and have ownership and are developing and designing themselves and are implementing, then they feel you have ownership over it. Like literally and physically, you have the ownership over the solutions. And that's also what the just transition is. So like as we're transitioning into the new economy, like new economy can sound like a really wonky, removed term of like whatever. Um, but if you look at like we're in an inevitable point of transition, we are transitioning away from a fossil fuel economy sooner or later, whether we like it or not. Like, the reality is that that's just going to have to happen. And what is that transition going to look like? Who's going to be owning it? Who's going to be designing it? Who's going to be implementing it? And who's going to be benefiting from it? And the folks who will benefit from it are the ones who are going to feel the ownership over it. And then you'll have folks being able to answer questions like what's happening to the bee population and the wind currents and how do you recycle solar panels. Like the worker-owned co-ops from the people who are owning those, those solutions are going to know those answers. I, just, I said earlier, I, like part of our role as experts is to bring a toolbox. But I think part of helping people own it is actually we don't have the solution. Right? It doesn't surprise me at all that engineers don't, who work on solar panels don't know how they recycle them. Right? And, and maybe the folks who build them and install them don't know that. Right? But if we actually engage in an authentic process where we ask people, what do you want your community to look like? like somebody might have that answer. Right? And it might be somebody we don't expect. And so I think there's a real process question, right? not just about how we figure out the solutions and who controls the results at the end, but about how we even understand the authority and expertise to come up with solutions. One more thing, I know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, we have so much time. Um, one other thing too is like, there are some communities who are not ready to talk about solutions yet, and that's also okay. Um, the Gulf Coast is where my family comes from, uh, and like, right now, folks there, and I'll, <laughs> I know my friend Karen is here too, so when I said earlier that I'm going to be bringing people into the room, some of them are also just actually in the room, um, who works in the Gulf Coast. But the Gulf Coast is not ready to be like, how are we going to build some solar panels and some offshore wind and stuff? Like, they're still dealing with how to even deal with the reality of the situation that they're in. They're still dealing with how to transition away from people saying they're resilient to actually being resistant. Because what's happening is the industry is like, oh, if you guys are resilient, like the Gulf Coast is resilient, we can just keep shitting on you and you'll just keep coming back from it because you guys are resilient. But the Gulf Coast is like, Fuck that, we're actually, we're coming up away from the resiliency model and we're resistant. That's not about solar panels. Like this is still, this is a just transition and this is a very like a solutions driven framework, but it's not people talking about like, how do we have community owned solar? Like there are some folks who are just not there yet, but it doesn't take away the relevancy of their, their position of leadership in this conversation. I, I think that um, the word resilience actually means to bounce back. And so the point that Ray's making is tremendously important. You, when you use the word resiliency, you're basically telling communities of color to bounce back. Bounce back to injustice, to racism, to police misconduct. We don't want to bounce back. Uh, so the word resistance is really the word that captures um, the way that the movement, the climate justice movement is framing it uh, from here all the way across to the West Coast. Um, any more questions? 
I, I'm gonna call on you, but, I'm, but I, I felt like Sunset Park was heavy, so I'm, I, I, I just... <laughs> I'm not even gonna go Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> My is more of a Latin American dance music. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because like, so much a question, as it is a um, of frustration, Sunset Park has gone through a lot of frustration, uh, particularly after having been there since 1964, <coughs> leading to find solutions, to find a way out, and then coming back, thank goodness, in time, while I, I could still afford it. Um, and I always come back, no matter how what I'm thinking about whether it's private, to the state of the education of our schools, um, the, the, the health, the public health of our children and our families. And the schools have known, and I dare say, correctly, anyone here, that's not only true of Sunset Park. I worked for many years in the South Bronx, in East Harlem, West Harlem, Bed-Stuy, um, doing in the world of uh, low-income housing, and such. And it was all, it was like one book was written somewhere out there, and everybody read the same book. And it was destroy the schools, do not teach these children what they need to have, a, to have a good life, to provide for themselves, to make a goal, to be at the table, to participate, and then sit back and everything will take care of itself because they'll be ready for the picnic. They'll be low hanging fruit. And so Sunset Park is poster child for that. Our public schools have not functioned for 25 years, for as long as I can remember. And um, we still are not there. And so when I, I see quite a, you know, the, the issue of environmental injustice, the issue of food deserts, but all these issues, we have not, and I'll stay in Sunset Park for this because we are quite to do it. We have not, in these neighborhoods, bred our own leadership. We have not bred our own engineers. We have not bred our own architects, our own lawyers with a few exceptions in the room, um, that you have to leave in order to kind of get a chance at life. And some people never came back. Some of us did. Uh, and to me, how do we get all this conversation? How do we do this so we do not keep having people coming in from the outside so, uh, and telling us what to do so we have the muscle from so the, the, the problem, so, so the problem that, that Maria is talking about is um, exists in all of our communities where you basically have social service organizations that turn communities into passive recipients of their good intentions. And young people get plugged into entry-level programs uh, through workforce development, but are not decision makers that are not at the table. They're not developing critical thinking skills. And for young people of color, for them not to be involved in leadership when climate change is here is, is, is just um, an indictment. Uh, movements have to be intergenerational. Learning happens across generations. Um, mentorship happens across generations to say that mentoring is, is it comes from one side is to basically miss what mentoring is and the learning is not going to be happening in the schools it's going to be happening in community organizations it's going to be happening in the streets it's going to be happening you know in, in, in the corner in the bodega uh, because we don't have the time right now to change the school system for these young people but what we can do and they told us they told us through black lives matter they kept telling us through the climate justice movement that they are not only stepping up but that they're they're ready for leadership but there is a narcotizing that happens in our communities through organizations that instead of making them leaderful is making them recipients of services and so it's something to really think about but I'm going to leave that there because one of the things I was concerned about is that we're talking about Sunset Park a lot and I don't want to do, I don't want to do that I, I, you know that's where we're from so we, so we're reppies but we can't we can't just talk about Sunset Park so any any other questions is a hand back there as a shy hand raise it <laughs>
compost, and there's like really good grocery stores. Of course, that has to be gentrification. And so, how can you get people to be eating these good foods for us that you know aren't part of the food industry? And um, more like, what are your are your organizations doing? Anything? So, food is incredibly important to health, and access to food is important to health. Um, folks know what healthy food is, but when it means that you can afford to buy a couple of bananas and a, a one bag of spinach versus uh, a meal that would feed the family, people are going to choose the meal that will feed the family, even though it's not as healthy. And so that's where the problem is. And we are working with community locally to talk about healthy food options. And we're not just talking about it in the sense of personal health. We're also talking about it in the sense of climate adaptation to use our land differently. Sunset Park is unique in that it is it doesn't have a lot of high-rise residences that you see in Manhattan, for example. There are a lot of smaller homes with some yard space. So we're talking to folks about how to use space, not just a yard or a roof, for your own benefit. Talking to folks about what it means to grow your own food and how on a block by block basis, which Elizabeth mentioned, working block by block to talk about not just growing your own food, but how can we share resources? Some people might have access to a yard, some people only have access to a roof. What, how can we make best use of our space and share the resources and the importance of healthy gardening. It is true that we do live near a lot of um, environmental pollutants, so we have to be aware of what it means when using our land for gardening for food. We have to do it in a very safe way, but it's possible. It's not an impossible task. And we actually have partnered with some schools in Sunset Park to talk about this and to talk about how we can use space within the school for gardening space and teach young people reach them at a young age to have them understand the importance of a connection with your own food and, and growing your own food. These are, these are things that are in our historical DNA. As people of color, our ancestors were very close to the earth. Our ancestors were farmers. So this is not something that's very distant in our historical memory. And so it's important to make connections and bring us back back to that. That doesn't mean that we're going to live off the land immediately tomorrow, but it's important to start those conversations because those conversations aren't having, happening from school administrators or teachers. They're happening because there might be one teacher who cares enough to bring in an organization like, the, like Uprose to talk directly to students about the importance of thinking differently about the way we live, about the way we eat, and thinking about climate adaptation. Ron, you had some questions, or can I have one little thing? Yeah, it's the final. No, no, just uh, like one intersection is that if you don't have time and you don't have money, having a good grocery store or a garden just doesn't help that much, right? And so, you know, we see the work we do around Fight for 15 and around fair scheduling and around a whole host of economic issues as food access issues, right? Like if you have the choice of eating a McDonald's burger on your way out of your shift, versus spending a half an hour going to the store, like, that's not just about not having a good store. It's about the fact that you might only have 20 minutes before your next job to take care of your kids. Right? And so I just would urge people